Thank you for everyone who's been hanging on the line and being patient. Um, so from, from a security point of view, there's a lot of and security is key. Um, uh, cloud, the cloud services are key in providing that security. So there are a bunch of data centers around the world that Microsoft have, over 100 data centers across the world. And the security of those, phys the physical security of those data centers is just as important as the cloud security that we're going to talk about in a second. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard the bitch talk about physical security of these data centers, but past posting guards with guns, which is not something Microsoft is currently planning to do, um, there's not a lot more in terms of the physical security that can be done. Now, I don't want to dwell on that too long, but there's a very high level of physical security in those data centers that provide this, provide the cloud services, the cloud security services. Um, and the foundation of, of Microsoft security is in this. You guys have probably seen this slide before. I'm hoping you have. Um, it's, and it's called the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph. And when I first saw this 18 months ago, it sounded like, you know, fantasy. And I think a lot of the people in here at JASCO have probably heard me talk about this before. But basically, there's a lot of information that Microsoft have that's available based on day-to-day -day, um, occurrences in, in Microsoft Cloud Services that they gain information from. So there are about 6.5 trillion signals per day that are processed by the intelligence security graph. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm okay, you know, humans are okay with creativity and with insight, but when it comes to trying to analyze a massive number or a, a massive amount of information, I struggle. Um, so this is where the, the artificial intelligence and the insights engines, insight engines of Microsoft have helped to process the amount of that information. Also, we need a lot of compute and a lot of storage to handle 6.5 trillion signals a day. So, um, or Microsoft do. If anyone on premises have the capability to do that, I'd love to talk to you um, because that's, that's a lot of power. Um, in the Microsoft Cloud, is able to do that, where on-premises we, we don't have that capability. And it really works. So there are, there are examples of where cloud security, um, we, we don't hear about the impact of things. So there's a couple of examples there where the, the first one um, was bytecode, or there was a malware that contained bytecode uh, to run on PCs, and Microsoft stopped this from being deployed, so caught it before it hit PCs, um, I think 400,000 PCs, from being infected with coin mining software. So it's basically a payload um, in software, installed some coin mining software on people's computers, Microsoft detected that, stopped that, removed that. Um, the second one there was obfuscated macros in documents. Um, so Microsoft stopped those before they were able to download malicious payloads. And then, of course, we get phishing attacks or phishing campaigns where um, 700,000 phish emails every month are blocked by Microsoft. And those are not spam, that's targeted phishing attempts. So there's a lot that Microsoft is, is stopping right now. <coughs> and Microsoft are approaching this, um, and here's an analogy of how they're approaching this across four key areas. And these are the things that we're going to cover off today. So identity and access management, threat pr protection, information protection, and security management. And while this is a little simplistic, this is a good way of, of viewing uh, what each of those areas does. So identity and access management is like your front door, protecting the front door of your house. Threat protection is the monitoring systems to watch what is going on. So is someone wandering around your house? You know, what, what is happening inside the house. Uh, information protection is knowing about what is, in, what is valuable in your house, so where your Xbox is stored, or where your Google Home is, is stored, um, or your jewels, or expensive items, the, the sensitive, the sensitive uh, pieces of information within your environment. And security management is a report card to tell you how that's all looking. And how to and what to do next 
more secure, not just how things are looking. So let me just, there we go. So Microsoft's approach is that identity is at the center of security. So think about 20 years ago when, um, if people have been in the IT industry that long, I have been. 20 years ago, remote access was very limited. We worked in an office, we plugged in via a cable. If we did have remote access, it was very much, I dialed in, I had a dedicated link from that computer into my office, I was on the office network. Our boundaries were really tightly defined. The security was tightly defined around those boundaries as well. Now think about today, I'm presenting from a Surface Pro, which is wirelessly connected, got a phone on my desk, got a tablet in my work bag, the same as everyone here, we, we work wirelessly. We don't limit ourselves to connecting in an office. People who are connecting remotely are coming in and talking to our infrastructure here to do the meeting presentation. So the boundaries, the boundaries are blurred. So that's why this shift of identity as the center of security. So if identity is the center of security, um, how do we stop identity-based attacks? So one of the one one of the ways that um, uh, we do that is by turning on um, risk policies um, and stopping stopping those attacks. But a, a lot of those attacks can be detected um, when you have that view of, of a global um, a global view of what's happening, of what's going on what the suspicious behavior is that you might not see if you're only looking at your environment. So that's where that, that concept of those, those uh, six and a half trillion signals a day being analyzed will pick up behaviors that you, won't, you may see on your network, but would be a lot harder to see. And the benefit is that if it gets detected somewhere else and picked up somewhere else and those patterns are identified somewhere else and it hits your environment, then you're protected. Um, one of the other challenges is that we've had is productivity versus security. So what Microsoft is trying to do is rather than say productivity and security, and people are just going, no, and I'll talk about MFA in a second. Um, but how, you know, we, once we increase productivity, we tend to reduce security by making things more accessible. If we increase security, we tend to reduce productivity because you have to do more to stay secure. So Microsoft's approach is to try and bring productivity and security together. And Microsoft call this identity governance. That's, that's just the term they give that. So once that updates uh, on screen, so a statistic some people might have heard is just enabling multi-factor authentication can increase your security from a password only point of view by 99.9%. Reduces the risk of an attack. So that's a, a password based attack, dictionary attacks or brute force attacks. So just by enabling MFA, you can reduce that by 99.9%. So Microsoft based this, they've got a, a formula they, they use to calculate per thousand um, authentication attempts based on the types of passwords people are using, whether they're weak or strong, um, and by enabling MFA, you reduce that, the risk of that attack. So the question is, have you turned on MFA? If you're already in the cloud, it's not hard. Particularly if you've got cloud-based services that are accessible from anywhere. Um, Just waiting for the next slide to come up. All right, so we've got this concept now of a zero trust network, whereas before we had a trusted network. So zero trust network is basically, rather than automatically trust where you're coming from, um, we're gonna say we don't trust, or we've got far less trust than we used to have. Um, and then we build levels of trust over that based on, on um, some of those things that you're seeing on screen at the moment. So 
Where is the, who is the user? What location are they coming in from? What device are you using? What application are you using? And some real-time risk statistics about that, about that authentication, with identity being at the center of that. So we, we do this currently at JASCO with multi-factor authentication. And we say that we trust people who are connected to our internal network on a domain joint computer. If we take that domain joint computer outside of the network, we still trust you've got a, an established level of trust. However, if you want to authenticate from a computer that is not domain joined, we do a conditional access policy and say we need you to provide us with some multi-factor authentication. So that's an example of how that works. But it's not limited only to um, blocking devices or allowing devices or requiring multi-factor authentication. So one, one of the other examples here that you're seeing on screen is that We've got the capability to say, what do we want to do with this document that someone is accessing, in this case, from Office 365? Um, if you're coming in from a computer, it could be an internet cafe. Uh, it's not a trusted computer. And so we're going to apply a conditional access policy that says, you're able to authenticate. We're going to require multi-factor authentication. We're going to allow you to access that document, but we're not going to allow you to download, print, or sync to that device, because we don't trust that device. You can still do your work, you can still edit that document in Excel online, but we are limiting the capability to leave that document on a machine that we don't necessarily want that document to remain on. Um, so it could be sensitive information, walk away, walk out of that uh, internet cafe, leave the machine logged on and the document's there, or even the next person that logs on with a generic logon to get access to that document. One of the other things that Microsoft is talking about in reducing uh, risk around password is to go passwordless. So this concept is reasonably new and it's a great concept, but right now there's a lot of work to be done. So the concept of not having a password at all, so authenticating to, to your applications and to your devices with with only a token or with an authenticator app or something else that you have rather than what you what you know. So Microsoft are, are starting on this journey to put an end to the era of passwords. That's, it's great, but it's gonna take some time. So we're not, we're not there yet. It's a lot of work. People are used to passwords. We're talking about just enabling MFA now. We've got, we've got a ways to go. Good concept, but we're not there yet. All right. Slides really bad. Here we go. So Microsoft's advice here, number one, or our guidance on this, turn on MFA. Whoops. Number two, uh, protect your apps with Azure AD conditional access. So that's that concept of doing, having those rules, those policies in place um, to allow access based on a set of rules. Um, and number three, begin your passwordless journey. So start thinking about other applications out there right now that might fit that concept of passwordless. Um, and start thinking and planning about that. So the second section we're going to look at is around threat protection. So that was identity, identity security, and we'll talk a little bit about threat protection. So on average, each company, according to Microsoft, has 60 to 80 different security tools. So it's going to depend on the company and the size of the company. I know we certainly don't have that many security tools, but I think we have that many security tools. Um, but that's a lot of security tools to have. Um, so they're all generating noise, they're generating alerts. In any organization, when we do any monitoring, we don't want that situation where it's like, oops, we missed the alert, that, that important alert in all of that noise. We missed the one that said, we've detected some malware. You know, we, uh, we need to action that. We don't want to lose that in the noise. Um, plus, we've got task overload. I don't know if there's anyone I've talked to in IT that says, oh yeah, I just had nothing to do all afternoon, so I played my Xbox instead. That doesn't happen. Um, we've got a lot of tasks, particularly in security. We suffer from task overload. Um, and we, we need to try and work through 
all of the noise, all of the other alerts, just you know, before we get to the meaningful alert, it's hard to keep up. So there's the example, uh, alert fatigue, disconnected tools and task overload. So Microsoft have announced Microsoft Threat Protection. Um, this is what we're gonna take a look at right now. And the Microsoft Graph Security API, which um, hooks into, uh, allows you to hook into Microsoft Threat Protection. So third party solutions, uh, same solutions to <coughs> this information. So what we're gonna look at here now, this is the, the um, Microsoft 365 Security Center. This was announced at Ignite this year, but it's not available yet. So we're going to see this sometime between now and the end of And I haven't seen it yet, unless it got released in the last six hours. Um, if anyone wants to jump in, jump in and have a look if it looks anything like this. Um, but the, the idea being here that um, we pull together information from users, devices, and email accounts. And what we're seeing here is a grouping of information based on focus areas rather than um, individual products. So you'll notice that we're not seeing, okay, Exchange Online, or we're not seeing Windows Event, uh, Defender Advanced Threat Protection. What we're seeing here is a group of active incidents that are talking about the types of compromises, the users with threat detection, our devices that are at risk, um, email accounts that might be at risk, uh, and our device threat analytics, and some threat news. So this concept of being incident, <laughs> incident focused and presenting this information to us in a way that we can absorb. So rather than looking at individual alerts, correlating those alerts together into something more meaningful that humans can understand. That's, that's the goal of the Microsoft 365 Security Center. So if we have a look at active incidents, so in this case, um, I mentioned it's not an isolated alert. Um, we've got an incident, if we look at any one of those incidents, maybe the first one, 496, where we were looking at some categories, it involves potential theft, potentially compromised account, uh, the detection source is email, so we had something that came in via email, something that was on a device, um, and also something that is looking you know, it's an identity attack against a user. Then, what was the what were the alerted identities? So there were 240 email accounts that were were identified as being potentially uh, under threat. So I've seen a lot of information, not individual alerts. Again, I'm not seeing 204 individual email accounts listed. I'm seeing one correlated incident. So if we clicked on that first one. Um, we've got a, a timeline view. So we've got our alerts, so we're looking at alerts here, and we can see all of the alerts associated with an incident, with that incident, and those alerts are presented to us on a timeline. So that we can go and see, for this incident, for all of these alerts that were correlated, what was the time frame of, of those alerts occurring. So if we clicked on this first one here, uh, we see when that happened, and this is the possible compromised account. Uh, if we clicked on the next one, we're going to look at is active credential theft tools. So again, you know, when did that occur in our timeline? So we get a good picture of, of when these alerts are occurring, um, and then in this case, when it was remediated. Um, if we clicked on suspicious PowerShell, we'd get some information about what that alert um, means. So in this case, um, what we're seeing is something that is some PowerShell that is being uh, run from Word. I don't know about you guys, but we don't, I don't usually see PowerShell being executed from Word. And this is part of what uh, the, this alert is telling us about. This is, un this is abnormal behavior. We haven't seen a virus definition that tells us that this is malware. We're seeing unusual behavior that's correlating to a bunch of other events. 
that we see a pattern in between that we're rolling into an incident. And the same for suspicious user A. We get that information uh, about what's happening with that user. What is suspicious about that? Is, is this a real, is this real suspicious behavior? Or if we went and talked to that user, is this just regular behavior? Is this something that is normal that we don't need to be concerned about? But we get the information, we get the capability to look at that and make that determination. So then from that incident, we can look at the devices affected. So um, how they're impacted. Uh, yeah, the devices that are affected and how they're impacted. So if you look at, it's a probably a little bit hard to see, but there are tags here in that middle section. What those tags say is highly confidential and conditional access applied. So the information protection component has uh, of um, the, the Microsoft, Secu uh, Microsoft Security has detected through uh, Azure Information Protection, which I think we'll talk about next, um, that we've got some sensitive documents on those computers. And as a result, it has gone and applied or changed the risk level to high risk because we've got some detected malware, some suspicious behavior that's occurring on those computers. And as a result of changing that risk level to high risk, highly confidential information, we've applied a conditional access policy. And that conditional access policy is dynamically applied because the risk level changed. We, we might do something there. We might say, okay, we think it's a password-based attack, or if the computer is at high risk, we're going to require MFA, multi-factor authentication, wherever you are, not just on untrusted networks or untrusted devices. Wherever you log in, you're at risk right now. Let's, let's do that automatically. And then the identities, the users that are affected by this particular um, incident. So we can go ahead and see which users, again, what's the threat score, um, have we had conditional access applied, um, and it gives us some scope to either talk to those users or do something about that. So then if we look at uh, investigations for that incident. So we looked at uh, the, the first or the, the part of this that kicked off some investigations, some, some suspicious PowerShell that ran. Um, and it's, it's fine that we can see all of the information about what's going in the, on in the environment, but it's also important to remediate that. You want to stop it from happening. You don't want to go, that's great, now I need to go and manually figure out how I'm going to stop that from occurring. We want something to, to stop that for us. That's what we're used to with, with any virus and any virus signatures right now, right? You detect a known threat, you stop that threat. Um, in some cases there are false positives and we need to be careful about that. And, and so basically, in this case, um, what we're looking at is information from the entire scope of you know, device, email, identity security, uh, looking at all of those things, picking up everywhere that that malware has touched, looking at email, looking at uh, files on devices, looking at files in SharePoint that would be affected, and going ahead and remediating them. Uh, and that's that's not necessarily only automated remediation, because as I said, we we want to be careful of those false positives. So in some cases, you might want to do like a semi-automated approach where the system tells you about a threat. You investigate that and you say, okay, this is a real threat, go ahead and remediate. That slows down your remediation time, but it means that you're going to be more accurate in, in terms of what we're remediating. And then a summary of, of what that, that remediation did. So we've got the full picture, what was affected, what we're remediating, and a summary of what was changed and what was removed. So in this case, there were 247 emails searched, 218 had fish in the junk folder, that's great, it's in the junk folder, it goes to the inbox, 29 fish messages did make it to the inbox. Uh, in a user investigation, we searched 62 users and found that there were four users with anomalies, so this is all that detection phase. In our data investigation, we searched 1,542 files and found that there were two documents at risk, Remediation completed, and that was all as a result of that suspicious power shell, I should have said. Remediation completed, found some threat, and if anyone's got really good eyes, malware is spelled incorrectly there. Um, and remediation actions are complete, so we reset for user.
the passwords for those four user accounts that were that thread had been reset. We need to tell the users about that. Um, we deleted 247 fish emails. Uh, we blocked two URLs uh, from those endpoints, so those endpoints can't access those URLs anymore. And we removed sharing from two documents. So that's the type of capability that Microsoft is looking at in that remediation process to automatically stop uh, those, those things from occurring. So going back to the main screen, I just wanted to scroll down a little bit to give you an indication of those, those other areas. So email protection, you get an idea there. Email threat analytics, device threat analytics, and this threat news. And I think we're going to focus in on threat news right now. So threat news is um, this concept of taking, uh, if anyone's signed up to any, any threat news, you know, there are a lot of vendors out there who have an automated service that tell you, um, even hardware manufacturers, when there is a threat of, um, that has been identified with their systems so that you can go and remediate that. You get a lot of, again, you're getting a lot of information from a lot of different areas, these individual alerts that we have to try and stay on top of. What Microsoft are trying to do here with the three, Microsoft 365 Security Center is to take that information, in this case, uh, threat news, and make something more meaningful of it. Now, this is, this is a fake example. But the example here is malware called Bad Kitten. And if, uh, if there was threat and malware out there that was called Bad Kitten, it's probably not going to be. It's probably the nicest sounding <laughs> malware you're ever going to come across, right? Bad Kitten. Um, anyway, so in the case of Bad Kitten, what we're going to look at is we get this information to look at the, to the bottom left, what we found or what we know about Bad Kitten. Um, an executive summary, our analysis, our detection details. Um, but what we also get, and what the benefit of having this information really is for me, is to see what is the impact of my environment. So how am I infected? How am I looking? How is my security posture looking? What is my machine mitigation status? Have we automatically mitigated? Is there a known uh, mitigation for this threat that we, we have as a, an antivirus signature or something else that's occurring and that we've mitigated this on X percentage of my machines, but I've still got a bunch that are at risk that I need to target. Um, who are my top impacted users? So people might be being hit and I need to go and talk to those users and say, please stop clicking on the link in that phish email or whatever I need to ask them to do. Um, to just say we've got a threat, we're aware of it, we're working on it. Um, and then the remediation tasks that we can take place. So this is, this is a way of taking a bunch of individual alerts from a source, and Microsoft are trying to get more and more information into this and make it more meaningful for me. Not generic information or generic alerts, but more meaningful for me and my environment. Uh, if we clicked on Start Investigation, there's a, a feature there called Advanced Hunting. And the whole purpose of Advanced Hunting, and people who have seen Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection may already have seen this before. Microsoft are expanding this to be across uh, the entire security center. The whole point here is that I can say, bad kitten goes and visits a bunch of URLs. So when people, um, uh, that when that malware runs on a computer, one of the things it does is goes and contacts these websites. Now I want to know which computers have done that. So I could go and look at firewall logs, I could go and look at proxy logs and try and figure that out. Or I can run an advanced, uh, advanced hunting to tell me from those endpoints which endpoints have gone out to those websites. Now, this is not something I'm just going to do once because people as a company don't just open an email all at once, right? So the capabilities is also there for me to schedule a query so that I can get this to run you know, once every hour, once every day, however often I want to run to alert me until I can get remediation in other ways in place, until I can get to my network team. Until I can say, guys, please block these you are with these uh, IP addresses, so that our guys don't go to those websites. Or if they try, we know they're not going to get out. But until then, I need to know do I need to target um, to do something on their computer? They've, they've hit that site. I need to do some other remediation. Until then, I need to know how we've been affected. And that's where advanced threat, uh, sorry, advanced hunting comes in. So the guidance on this is check out Microsoft Threat Protection at security.microsoft.com. There is some stuff there now. It won't look like what I just showed you. 
Um, but there is a lot of information there if you've already got a Microsoft uh, Office 365 subscription. There is a lot of security information there already. Um, and hopefully in the next two to three months, we will see a lot more of that correlated information that, it, that are based on those um, the grouping of incidents. Grouping of information into incidents, I should say. Uh, deploy Office 365 ATP, uh, Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection and Azure Advanced Threat Protection. So that's identity, endpoints, email, and uh, SharePoint Online. And turn on the Azure Security Center. So the Azure Security Center is there now, and that's going to grow and expand to include a lot more. But um, turn on the Azure Security Center now, and this is not just for Azure. So you can look at managing and monitoring from a security perspective, virtual machines and, and services in Azure, and also on-premises as well. So now we'll talk about information protection. Uh, this will be reasonably brief. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, so information protection, what is Microsoft's view of information protection? So concept here is that you have a clear roadmap uh, you've got a clear understanding of what your data is and what parts of it are important. So think about that in terms of policy. So you have one set of labels to define um, what, how information is classified. So um, you know, what, is, what matters and how are we going to handle it? So those labels are all about classifying your data. And then look to move from a world of scattered knowledge, and what they, they're talking about there, about scattered knowledge is not knowing what types of information you have or what types of documents you have in your environment, to going to knowing you know, how they're classified, what is sensitive, what is not sensitive, where is it? And then um, move from a world of, I don't like the term poor user enforcement, but try to make it more intuitive so that we, we don't just present people with a bunch of categories and say, please categorize your documents. How, how is that going to work? You know, that's, we're probably not going to have a high success rate, but start with trying to automatically classify a document. So have a default classification for documents. If you detect credit card numbers or if you detect the word invoice or um, confidential or whatever in a document, then let's automatically classify that and let the person know that we've automatically classified that um, and then let them make another assessment about that and say, no, that's not sensitive. So while I've got the word credit card in there, this document doesn't contain any credit card information. I'm just writing an email to someone about a new credit card policy or whatever the, the case is. So that's what that is about, about helping people to make good decisions about how we label documents. So broken down into four areas. So discovery and classification uh, is used for discovering the data in the environment, um, which then leads to classifying the data in the environment based on those labels we just talked about. Using that information then, um, defining the discovery and classification to ultimately protect that sensitive information. That's what we're concerned about, the sensitive information. And then to form an anchor for compliance. So, um, how we handle that data in the way that customers need, or, or are there any other compliance requirements for certain types of documents in your organization that you need to enforce? And Microsoft 365 Security Center, surprise, surprise, is that one place where Microsoft are bringing the information in together so that you can then go and view that in one place. So we go to the Microsoft 365 Security Center, we see that information, we have visibility of that information, what's being labeled, uh, what's auto-applied, what's manually applied, what's not applied, what's not classified, what's at risk, those, those types of uh, things. So that's, that's information protection. One of the other levels of information protection within Azure that I'll quickly talk about, I haven't talked about cloud app security, which is another, uh, another component. Um, I wanted to do another session on that in the future. Um, so I won't delve into cloud app security, that feeds into this, this information again, how people are using apps um, and where data is being stored based on you know, those third-party or external apps in an environment. That's an important part of it. 
Um, but protect, protecting data in Azure with Azure Confidential Computing. So right now, we've already got encrypted disks in Azure. Data is encrypted going in and out of Azure um, and between networks in Azure. Uh, but now we've got the capability to protect data from that first point inside the CPU from malicious access. So this is based on Intel's uh, S SGX, SGX te technology, yes. Um, and that basically means that you as the owner of that virtual machine are the only one that can access that. So the host machine can no longer see the data inside the virtual machine. Microsoft can't even see when we turn on this level of, of protection. So if there is a case where you need to do that, the information on a virtual machine is so sensitive, um, then you can go to that level of protection. And that's available as the DC class uh, of VMs in Azure. Don't know whether it's available in Australia yet. I haven't checked that. Um, so the guidance here is start classifying content, deploy Microsoft Cloud App Security. As I mentioned, I, we didn't talk about that today, um, and use the Azure Confidential Computing VMs where where it makes sense. You know, you wouldn't turn this on on a server where if you don't have confidential information. You know, there's a cost and there's an overhead there. And security management. So this is the last in those, those four areas. Where security can sometimes really be a thankless, a thankless sort of job, uh, a thankless job. I mean, at the end of the day, really, there are two outcomes. So number one, uh, nobody got hacked. No data was breached. And everything's good, right? We're all happy. What's the other outcome? Something terrible happens. And people say to you, what are you doing? Why didn't you do it better? So it can be thankless. We, we tend to see when we have breaches. News loves talking about when we have breaches. Um, so it's important to understand what the things are in the environment, what your security posture is. We talked a little bit about this before, applying um, you know, what, what threats are out there to your environment so it makes sense. And we talked about you know, that, that too much to do, we never get to the end of the list. So we want to take those uncertain configurations, we want to understand our, our posture. We want to try and get to the bottom of that list. Um, and one of the things that uh, we, we do as humans generally is we, we're always excited about the thing that we fixed. Like we're not necessarily looking for the next thing that we're going to fix. It's like, hey, we fixed it, we stopped it, we stopped that malware. And that's, that's a good thing. But we're not excited, we're not saying, hey, I can't wait to get to that next bit of malware that I'm gonna stop. It's just, it's just human nature. Um, one of the things that Microsoft are, are doing to try and improve security, and here's another one of those figures. Um, take with a grain of salt if you like, but the secure score, and I'm not sure if anyone's Seeing the secure score, so it's there for Office 365 right now. I think on the next slide we talk about it a bit more. But just by virtue of the fact that you're looking at what I can do to improve security means that you improve security. So if someone says to you in a clear and easy to absorb way, by doing these things, you are going to improve your security, you naturally go, well, I can do that. Or I can do two out of those five things, or five out of those 15 things. And I'm going to improve my security dramatically. Just by virtue of looking at Microsoft is saying that you can improve by 30 times. It's 30 times more secure. So as a result of that, Microsoft are expanding Secure Score, which is now available for Office 365. You go, if you've got an Office 365 subscription, you go to Secure Score, you see your Secure Score is there for Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection if you're using that, and you'll get an overall security score. But Microsoft are expanding that to include EMS, Enterprise Mobility and Security, and Azure. So you get visibility across all of those parts. How can I improve my security? And then look something like this in the new security center. Right now, you just get a couple of donut shaped wheels telling you what your score is. And underneath that, a list of tasks based on where I want my score to be as to what I want to, want to achieve. So the secure score is built up. It's not everything that Microsoft can possibly do across all of their products. This is tailored to your environment of what services you're running. So what services you're running in Office 365? What services you're running uh, in Azure? And it basically says, 
Microsoft have attributed a score based on their level of importance. And so in this case, secure score of 850 out of 1405. And it's broken down not into products, it's broken down into those key areas that we've already looked at, identity, data, devices, applications, infrastructure, the things that are gonna be more meaningful to us. How's my infrastructure looking? How are my Azure virtual machines? How are my on-premises um, machines and virtual machines looking from a security standpoint? Um, what, do I, what can I do to improve the security of that? So moving away from a product-centric view. And then um, if I clicked on take action on one of those uh, settings, the benefit of secure score, and this is kind of how it works today already, but expanding that, uh, we get, oops, I think I've gone one too far. Yep. We get a slide in, uh, which tells us a little bit about what we're gonna do, what am, I, what am I about to change, how will this affect my users, and what you can't see there is a link to take me straight to the console to do that, if I wanna do that right now. Or, okay, I need to warn people about this, I need to send out notification or whatever. And then monitoring and reports um, are all fed in from those systems uh, into the one place again, into the Microsoft 365 Security Center, so that we can see all of that information um, together, without having to go somewhere else to do that, that reporting. And if we scroll down to the main screen, I just wanted to show you that there's that, there's that infrastructure view, uh, security subscription covering and Azure policy compliance, how are we tracking overall with those things? And then we can drill down and, and make some determinations there. So the guidance here is around security management. Is it secure score? See your score. And make a plan to improve your score. That's the goal here. Make yourself more secure. See what things are gonna be quick and easy that you can do to improve the security in your environment. And from the point of view of um, how Microsoft are approaching this, they're not doing this alone. So the Microsoft Intelligence Security Association is just a collaboration of a, a group of people. I think this is where it started at about 18 months ago with Microsoft. And in the last six months, I think they've added all of those once that pops up on the screen. So it's not a Microsoft approaching this from on their own. This is Microsoft collaborating with a lot of other vendors. There we go. It's updated at my end if you guys can see it. I think that's a duplicate slide. We just did that, didn't we? All right. So that's the end of my presentation. So thank you everyone for listening. I appreciate your time. Um, the Ignite content that I mentioned, once that refreshes on screen, is available online. So myignite.techcommunity.microsoft.com slash videos. Come on, slide deck. And um, if you've got any questions or you want more information about this, please visit us at www.jesco.net.au. There we go. I think well, I'll make that link available on our website, I think, um, or on my LinkedIn page, I might post it there. And the next slide is a shameless plug. Next week, coming up, once it refreshes. So next week, we're going to take a deep dive into what's new with Server 2019. So you might think uh, this is standalone product on this is, uh, this is uh, I'll, I'll give away a little spoiler, a lot of hybrid in Server 2019 if you hadn't guessed it. So we're about a slide behind. No, there we go. Um, there's a, there are a lot of demos next week. So I'm gonna try and cram, I think about four or five demos about how a lot of this stuff works. So it's gonna be fast paced. I'm probably gonna talk a lot faster than I did today, even though a marketing manager tells me to talk slower. <laughs> but there's a lot that I wanna cover there. Um, I'm going to try and stay on time for that one. Hopefully the demo gods will be kind. Um, but stay tuned for that. Uh, and again, this is me. If you want to follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn, those are my details. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, fire away. If anyone externally has any questions, please feel free to drop them into the messages window and we'll try to answer them. Thanks, Danny.
Thank you. Thanks.